This is the Friday, April 17, 2020 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now via the power of technology, warm and sunny Florida, Sean Hackett. Sean, I got to say, first off, we try to have as cold a weather for you and John Roach and you guys come up from this Florida. Book you in, <laughs> ju in January. Here we book you in April when you were supposed to be here. Thank goodness it snowed last night for us. Are you disappointed that you missed the snow? I mean, you're a Jersey guy. It's not like you've not I'm, seen snow before. I'm really devastated. I was really hoping to throw us a few snowballs. I really was. <laughs> well, <laughs> we have a question about snow that we'll get to here in just a moment with Market Plus. This, I guess I want to first ask a perspective question. Have you ever seen the markets do what they have done, all of them, for as long of a period? And, and you can talk equities, too. But commodities, everything down like it's been for this long. I have not. In the 20 years that I've been following markets and managing markets, I've seen a lot of different things. I thought I saw it all. But I have to tell you that this is truly unprecedented. The velocity, the volatility uh, has been just mind boggling. Um, we'll look back at this time, Paul, and, and, um, and, and just admire the, the, the insanity of what took place. It was, it was such a shock to the system. So what are your clients telling you when they call? I know you're not on the road right now. Nobody's on the road right now. What have people been telling you, like, can I hold out? I mean, we hear these anecdotal stories of land coming up for rent suddenly, or which we haven't really heard too much of. Are, are you hearing people are like, I really don't know how much lower or longer I can hang on? Paul, what I'm hearing is farmers are extremely scared. Um, and they're actually losing optimism. I, you know, in my, in my entire career, I've never actually seen a farmer lose optimism. He could be negative, he could be down the mouth, but I actually feel that this is breaking the back of their optimism. I've never seen that happen before. It's really, really sad. And I'm really, really praying that, that we see better times ahead and their optimism can come back because we need an optimistic farmer in the U.S. to provide food on the table for us. Well, let's uh, hit one of the questions that you handled a little bit in the market analysis segment. And all of these questions come in via Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can also email us anytime, market to market at iowapbs.org. This first one is from Rodney in Edgar, Wisconsin. We already talked about dairy, but he wants to know about cattle prices. How long will it take to get cattle prices back to 2019 prices? once the government opens up the country. You and I were discussing this a little bit about the delay of the country. You were saying a May or a June one. Let's use a June one scenario for the answer of your question. Based upon our work on pandemics, I did 500 years of analysis. It's a W. That's what they, you typically are. And that means that if we start June 1st, the W lasts three to four months before we reach the euphoric period of we opened up and then we have to deal with the longer term damage to the economy. So if we just use that timeline, that would suggest, you know, better prices into the late summer, September timeframe would be the ideal time for that part of the W to you know, bring cattle prices as high as they can go at this point. Well, you have this whole thing. You've seen it online. I've seen it online. The, the people complaining, uh, and, and rightfully so, uh, the packer is making this money. I'm not. How come when I go to the store, there is food there, but this costs more than that? What is the factors? I mean, we know logistics is part of this, and, and maybe a store is just not put it out on the shelf. It's in the box before you buy it. I mean, what's going on here and that discrepancy between the packer and the producer and what they're getting? Well, we saw this the record packer margins and the Tyson fire situation, if you recall. It seems that we've gotten too concentrated, Paul. And when you get so concentrated, you have a few people that are controlling too much of the throughput, uh, they kind of can, you know, make the market what they wish from it. And, and that's actually, you know, I think there's, you know, there's an investigation that took place back then and there's more investigations going on now. And I think that is a good thing. I think we do need to look at, is this really in the best interest of the long-term health of the U.S. livestock sector? And, and it probably is not in the best health. And maybe we need, to have a shifting of how this ownership takes place and how this, how this, we shouldn't have all the money in one place and no money in the other place. It should be an equitable distribution. Well, as you said, a lot of things are going to be studied here. One of the things that uh, Phil in Dresden, Ontario, Canada, hello, Phil, he is asking, are soybeans the better bet for profitable prices in 2020 versus planting corn? We actually feel that the corn market at this point has better prospects. 
Uh, we really say that because we think that the crops in South America for corn are poor and, are, and, and actually are, are overestimated right now. Um, and we think that the soybean crop in South America is really actually pretty good. And so when we look at what's going to be available for export as we move into the summertime, uh, we think the corn supplies are going to be very, very difficult to come by out of South America. Remember, Brazil is already extremely tight with their corn supplies, huge premiums to U.S. price. So, so for a whole host of reasons, you know, and don't forget the ethanol debacle. If we do get crude oil prices taken off later in the year and ethanol takes off, there could be a huge adjustment that needs to take place. From where we are, we think the car market offers better upside opportunity right now. All right. Well, Dan in Geneseo, Illinois, posted on our Facebook page. He says, if this large crop is realized, do you think that the new crop corn and bean carries will be historically large? You just talked about South America. What about in the United States? I guess it really depends on what the demand side picture is, Paul. You know, I mean, uh, a big crop isn't a problem if the demand is there to take it in. We think the demand is going to be much, much better than people are expecting in the fall uh, than in the current expectations. So even if we deliver on the large crop, which we don't think is likely, we don't think that we're going to have record setting spreads. We think that demand will be there to keep the spreads more normal than in blowing them out to record setting levels. We think there's going to be better demand for that. But the, a little bit of that, though, I, I have to kind of grouse a little bit. Sorry. Uh, the ethanol part of this equation, I talk about you getting on a plane or getting into a car. Nobody really wants to drive or is driving right now to eat into that. I saw gas in Iowa below a dollar this morning. We've seen it in Wisconsin and Minnesota. I'm sure you're seeing it down there. We have these stacks and stacks of of grain that's been processed in ethanol. The tank is full. The oil tank is full. We're going to have to stop producing pretty soon. I don't know how that equates. How are we going to chew through this if we're already full, even if we start driving June 1? Well, I mean, there's going to be a, there is a supply response already going on. Uh, the rate count continues to crash. So U.S. production, the fracking industry is upside down, uh, the, and the Wall Street money is gone. So I think there's two components to this. The demand side, which will be better. It's not going to be what it was, but it will be better. But the supply contraction we see in the fracking production later in the season, we think is actually going to create a better environment than demand by itself. It, it takes two to tango. We think that combination will allow for a pretty large increase in fuel prices and, a, and an ability for the ethanol price to see levels that will bring some of this back online again. Well, and to show how the consumer is ready for that, there was video in West Davenport, Iowa, Sean, today. There were about five or six people on the road, let alone uh, queued up at a gas station for sub 99 cent gas. So people are, they do see a bargain, they see do, uh, do it. I wanna say Wes and Arcadia, thank you for your question. We kind of talked about the bottom already. So I wanna get to Brian and Iowa. This one's an interesting one. And, and Sean, it's really right up your alley. We don't talk about citrus too much, but Brian is asking, what are your thoughts on the USDA approving citrus from China? Well, it's particular citrus fruit. It's, it's, it's kind of exotic citrus fruit that you know, we don't necessarily produce a lot of. So, so it, it's kind of the idea that if we're trying to do as part of this trade deal and opening markets on both sides of who has a, a reason to sell and buy. And so I think this was our olive leaf that will bring some of the citrus in because we want them to buy some of our grain and that sort of thing. But it really is not going to compete with the orange juice and the fruit and, and our bread and butter that we still you know, want to be able to sell and, and grow domestically. So, so as much as it doesn't sound like a good idea, if it produce, if it allows for better trade on other ag markets, it's probably a good thing in the long run. All right, here's a question. How does one make money now? Uh, Austin in Belmont, he's asking, uh, Belmont, Iowa, are there ways to lock in some profits at these levels? Let's, play, let's do a little uh, use of options lesson. Well, look, you know, if you're in the, the livestock business or you're in any part of the ag food chain and you're trying to figure out how you can extract a, a price level that can get you a profitable price, you know, you're going to have to try to, I'm not, I wouldn't say trade the market, but you're going to have to try to use your hedges, to take advantage of the volatility that we had. So for example, if you put hedges on in the summer of last year, you made a lot of money on the downswing. So if you're in the position to, you know, put some positions on, on the low side and we, let's say, you know, rally the market back up to where it was earlier in the year, you know, all those, that all that accrues to your net price at the end of the day, plus any government payments that may be coming in. 
So, so you know, that's kind of, you know, you can also play the carry, Paul, you know, you sell the further out and the carry comes in, you sell the carry that comes in and those accrue to your net sales price. And there's a lot of different ways one can slice and dice how you can add cents to your bushels. It really depends on your situation, how much capital you have available and, and really, you know, what, how large you are and, and, and what your options are, you know. Okay, call your advisor for a little bit of advice there. All right, Sean, uh, two quick questions here. Derek in Iowa is asking, he's asking about how with all the closing of the various livestock harvesting facilities affect the grain markets. Let's focus on the second half here. What impact can be expected on local basis spreads? You mean the spreads between two different? Well, yeah, when it's, when it's the closing of various livestock harvesting facilities affect the grain market. So say you're in Sioux Falls or near Greeley or near in Kansas City or, or Milwaukee where these plants have closed. What's going to have, is that going to impact basis at all grain-wise? Well, it already has impact basis. I mean, the basis has already crashed in those areas where the demand has gone away and it's, and it's strong in areas that weren't dependent upon it. I would argue that we're going to get a normalization of basis a little bit that if some of these plants come back online or deep pocket buyers buy some of these assets, if they're available, you know, we actually may see some demand come back in and get some of this basis to narrow between these two regions. So I think most of the basis widening has already taken place in terms of the spreads between these disparity regions, between those that depend upon ethanol and those that do not. One final question, and I teased it off the top. This one's about snow, Sean. I know you love snow. I do. Preston in Iowa, where he had snow. Uh, how many inches of snow is the correct amount to start planting? He says his grandpa never told him. I heard that snow makes grain. Snow makes grain? Where'd you hear that one? <laughs> oh, I, I heard it at my, my, my local barbershop. Oh, your local barbershop, when it was still open. <laughs> when it was still open, yes, yes, uh, yes. You know, that's the thing. We saw planters rolling last week here, uh, and I know they were to the south of us. To the south of us is where this snow came in. I mean, how weather becomes an issue when in this market? Because we proved last year we can plant this thing into June or July and still make almost average yields. So is there any weather wiggle here? I don't think the market's going to play weather on planting this season after you just correctly said last year, you know, we planted the unthinkable so late it all worked out. So I think if, you know, if we're going to get weather in, in part of the equation, Paul, it's going to be after it gets planted, you know, the, the typical growing seasons where weather could come in and do something. I can't imagine that there's going to be any appetite to drive the market higher after what happened last year. I just think they're going to say it's all going to work out. And, and based upon last year, they're correct. <laughs> okay. All right. Sean Hackett, thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Good to see you. Have a good afternoon there and a good trip home. Ten steps up the stairs. Join us again next week when we'll explore the continued effects of COVID-19 on rural America's bottom line. And Arlen Suderman will join me here to look at trends in the commodity markets. Until then, thanks for watching, listening, or reading. I am Paul Yeager. Have a great week.